Eleanor from the KU Natural History Museum, and this is Pop-Up Science Online. I am so excited that you're joining me for this final and very special episode. It's hard to believe that we've been doing this program as a video series for over a year now. As the museum begins planning for in-person events, we will reduce some of our video-based content, including pop-up science, while we prepare to see our wonderful visitors at drop-in programs once again. So I'm going to keep my fingers crossed to see many of you in person at a future pop-up science event at the museum. Okay, so what are we doing today? We're going to learn all about fossil shark teeth. Sharks have existed on Earth for over 400 million years, and they've served as important predators in the planet's marine ecosystems throughout geologic time. Fossilized teeth are some of the very best evidence, and often the only evidence, that we have of ancient sharks and how they adapted and changed over millions of years. If you remember, I mentioned that this was a very special episode of Pop-Up Science. That's because we're going to meet paleontologists from the Aurora Fossil Museum in North Carolina, who will help us to learn about ancient sharks. In fact, the Aurora Fossil Museum just celebrated National Megalodon Day earlier this week, the very first time it had ever been celebrated because the North Carolina State Legislature proclaimed June 15th, 2021 to be the first National Megalodon Day. We'll get to see some incredible fossil megalodon teeth later in this video. And if you picked up a science kit from the KU Natural History Museum earlier this month, then you got a sample of fossil matrix sediment from the Aurora Fossil Museum. If you didn't get a kit, no problem. You can still enjoy today's program and learn all about ancient sharks and their fossilized remains. First, let's orient ourselves in terms of geologic time. Although sharks have existed for over 400 million years, the fossilized shark teeth and other kinds of fossils from Aurora are much younger than that. The matrix in your science kit comes from rock layers that were deposited between 20 million years ago and about two and a half million years ago. That means the sediment comes from the Miocene and Pliocene epochs, which are the two ages that make up the Neogene period. The Neogene period occurred in the middle of the Cenozoic era which is the Earth's current geologic era. We're still in the Cenozoic era right now. So for the fossils from Aurora, although they're millions of years old, they're much younger than most of what is preserved in the rock layers here in Kansas. Now, the fossil-filled Miocene and Pliocene age rock layers at Aurora are covered by even younger rock layers from the Pleistocene and Holocene epochs. So how does the museum get to the fossil-rich layers? through a mine. A phosphate mine operated by the Nutrien Company has exposed many of the rock layers in the Aurora area, representing millions and millions of years back in time. Because the mine has no use for the fossil rich layers, which sit on top of the phosphate that they're trying to reach, they give the fossil sediment to the Aurora Fossil Museum. Let's go there and meet geologist Andrew Dietschy and fossil tooth specialist, Dr. George Oliver. Hello, and welcome to Aurora Fossil Museum. My name is Andrew Dietschy, and I'm gonna give you a short tour of our fossil museum. But first I wanna talk about where Aurora is and the two events that made it possible for us to be where we are. All right, if you look up here at the map, here's our state capital Raleigh in the middle, and Aurora is out here on the eastern coast uh, in this light yellow area. The light yellow area of this geologic map indicates that the ground below us is sediments. So if you dug down, you just run into a whole bunch of sediment, uh, not too much hard rock. Now that's because of the two events that I'm about to talk about, a transgressive event and a regressive event. A transgressive event is when the sea level rises, it pushes the beach inward, inland and floods the coastal area, creating an area of deposition. And then a regressive event is when sea level falls pushes the beach out, dries up the coastal area, and not as much deposition occurs. This happens several times over millions of years, uh, which creates the layered sediment that's below us. Now all this sediment creates layers above the fossils that we're trying to get to. So we have to dig down to those fossils. But we don't have to do that ourselves. We have a local phosphate mine that does that for us. And because of that, we have a whole room dedicated to that mining process. So let's go into that room and see what's going on there. Hey, welcome to the Nutrient Mine Room. 
It's basically a giant model of what it would look like if you were in the mine uh, looking at a, a sheer wall of, of the different layers. And so here you can see the different layers that those, those transgressive and regressive events created uh, throughout the millions of years. And some of these uh, layers have like no fossils, like up top, some have a lot of fossils, and some have very few fossils. Um, the two layers that really interest us are the shell bed, which is at the top layer up here, and that's called that because it mainly consists of just shells. And this lower layer here called the Lower Yorktown, and that has shark teeth and whale bones and fish parts and all sorts of fossils that we like to find to put into our museum. So what happens is they'll dig this layer out and drop it at our doorstep so the mine can get to the phosphate below. And our number one fossil that we like to collect is shark teeth. And we have a whole room dedicated to shark teeth fossils. So come on with me to the shark tooth room. It's right in here. Welcome to the shark tooth room. This is the room dedicated to all the shark teeth that we can find in the material that gets dumped at our front door. Uh, I'm standing right here with the most sought after tooth, the megalodon tooth. It happens to be the biggest tooth you can find because it came from the largest species to ever exist of all sharks. There are two main questions that get asked here at the museum all the time. Why do we find so many teeth and why is it typically the only teeth that we find? Well, we do find quite a few vertebrae. Now vertebrae are just uh, sections of backbone. So if this is their backbone that's laying like on the sediment floor. Uh, a vertebrae would be one single section of that. You can see them kind of here. If you took a section and laid it down, it would look just like this. And here's some bigger size vertebrae. They look like little indented drums. Sometimes you can find other parts, but they're extremely rare. And that's because their skeletal system isn't made of the hard calcified bone like you find in us. Their skeletal system is made of cartilage. So the hardest parts of animals typically stick around to be fossilized. And the hardest part of a shark is their teeth. So that's why we typically find only their teeth. Um, now, why do we find so many of their teeth? If you look at a shark jaw, you see there's many different rows of teeth in the jaw, okay? You, can, you have an outer row and then inner rows all the way into the jaw. And it's not really the number of rows that's important, it's each little column of teeth that's important. There's several teeth in line to replace the most outer tooth that they use for eating. Um, and each column grows separately. It grows almost like your fingernail or your hair. And it's always growing out, and if the tooth isn't ripped out through the eating process or something, something else, it will eventually just fall out and the new, a new tooth that's waiting in line will replace it. And new teeth are always being created in the gum line in their jaw. And that's why we find a lot of teeth. Now, let's pause for a moment and pull out our science kits. So I have mine here and in it, we have the fossil matrix sediment from the Aurora Fossil Museum. You can see some stuff in there. We also have a fossil picking tool, and we have a fossil sorting grid, as well as the fossil ID guide. And I also have my hand lens, my geologic hand lens, which lets me look at fossils and rock specimens up close. Um, and so if you don't have a hand lens at home, but you happen to have a magnifying glass, that would work really well for observing your fossils up close. Okay, so I'm gonna take sediment and spread some of it out. Oh, I see a shark tooth, all right. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven shark teeth or fragments, and then the stingray mouth plate. So at this point, what I'm gonna do is try to identify some of these um, specimens. I'm looking at our ID over here. I am thinking that it is either a lemon shark or a requiem shark. 
let's look at this one, which is kind of an unusual shape, or at least in my opinion. And it has um, a serrated secondary edge that's a lot smaller. So looking at the ID guide here, I believe that this is part of a tiger shark tooth that has, the part of it has broken off based on that little kind of edge right here that also has serrations. So this is just an example of some of the type of things that you may be able to find in your Aurora sand. And we would love to see what you discover in your kit. Let's turn back to the staff at the Aurora Fossil Museum to learn more about identifying these fascinating fossils. I'm joined here by our on-site educator, Dr. George. He's gonna help us identify some of the shark teeth that we have in our shark tooth room. We're just gonna quickly go through some of the shark's teeth, the more common shark's teeth that we have here in our shark room at the Aurora Fossil Museum. First, of course, we have the Megalodon, the biggest shark ever. Uh, how do you tell a Megalodon teeth? Well, one thing is the size. If it's over about three inches long, it's got to be a Megalodon because that was the biggest shark tooth ever. Uh, other characteristics that you can use, if it's not that big, uh, but just looking at the tooth, and some Megalodon, as you can see here, are very small in the back of the mouth or maybe a baby shark. But even the small Megalodons have these characteristics. It has a serrated edge, like a soft tooth, a serrated edge, and it has this special area called the chevron or burlap. It's basically a V-shaped border between the root and the crown of the tooth. Four different kinds of mako sharks here. The mako shark is a beautiful tooth. Uh, it has a smooth edge, no serrations, and it has various shapes depending on the mouth position and the type of mako that it is. Uh, next, we have the sand tigers. The sand tigers, there are 13 different kinds here, but they have a characteristic is that they all have a little pointy thing on each side called a cusp, a little sharp cusp. Uh, occasionally that will wear off and you can still tell it's a sand tiger because it's long and narrow shape. Okay, so that's your sand tiger. Next, one of my favorite teeth is the snaggletooth shark. The snaggletooth shark is a little hard to identify because it has several different shapes in the same shark. The upper teeth have a rough serrated edge, that's where it gets the name snaggletooth, and they're kind of flat. The lower teeth uh, have smaller serrations, they're not as rough, and they're more pointy shaped. Uh, next, the tiger shark. We have three different types of tiger shark here. Uh, the best way to tell a tiger shark is very slanted. It has a very slanted shape, and characteristically, on one side of the mouth, the teeth slant this way, and the other side of the mouth, they slant that way. Uh, this is a modern tiger shark. It's one of the most beautiful teeth that we have here. Very pretty colors, pretty shape. So this is your modern tiger. Uh, they're fossils, but they're not extinct. The last thing I want to talk to you about is what this Megalodon ate. And that's a, you know, a pretty good question that we usually get. How do we know what they ate? How do they get so big? Well, we know that they ate whale. And one of the reasons we know that is because we have whale bone that actually have shark tooth uh, marks in it. And we know they're shark tooth marks because they actually line up really well with Megalodon shark teeth. Um, in fact, right here you can kind of see it follows the groove of the shark tooth. So we actually, this is not the only case that we have. We have many whale bones that have shark teeth uh, cuts in them. So we know that they fed on a lot of uh, whales. And this is a big whale bone. So clearly it was feeding on a very large whale. So that's about it. If you guys want to come join us uh, to find your own fossils or just look around, that'd be great. We'd lo love to have you here at the Aurora Fossil Museum. Bye. That was great. Thanks so much for that tour and information, Andrew and Dr. George. Two things that they didn't mention are brand new scientific studies that were published earlier this year. The first study published in the journal Paleontologia Electronica back in March shows that Carcharicles megalodon may have been even bigger than previously thought. These new calculations indicate that the megalodon shark could have measured up to 65 feet long, nearly the length of two school buses. How cool is that? And the second study published in the journal Science just earlier this month on June 4th presents evidence of a previously unrecognized global mass extinction event impacting sharks during the Miocene epoch. 
This extinction event caused shark diversity to plummet by somewhere between 70 to 90 percent, especially affecting open ocean species like cookie cutter sharks. Maybe this extinction event can help to explain the abundance of shark teeth preserved in the Miocene age rocks at Aurora. Last but not least, I'd like to take a moment to compare the fossil shark teeth you can find in Aurora versus some fossil shark teeth found in eastern Kansas. Fossil shark teeth from around here are less abundant and much older than the shark teeth preserved at Aurora. Here in eastern Kansas, the rock layers date to the Carboniferous and Permian periods, representing a block of time from about 320 million years ago to 271 million years ago. One example is an ancient shark called Petalotus, with unusual kind of oval-shaped teeth that it used to crush the hard shells of brachiopods. Another example is the primitive shark Clodotus, with teeth which help to snag fish and then swallow them whole. And then lastly, the large shark Orotus was a relative of modern ratfish, and it had broad pavement-like teeth for crushing crustaceans and mollusks. Well, that's all that we have time for today. We covered a lot of information, and I hope that you enjoyed hearing about fossil shark teeth with me, as well as our awesome guests from the Aurora Fossil Museum. Have fun sorting through your matrix sediment and identifying the shark teeth and other fossils. We would love to see what you find, so please, please post pictures of your discoveries and tag the museum on our social media. And be sure to check out the Aurora Fossil Museum if you ever travel to Eastern North Carolina. Have a wonderful summer, and I'll look forward to seeing you in person at the museum. Bye!